good morning from where I am uh, here in the East Coast on the US. Uh, that might be a good afternoon, a good evening, or a good, uh, very odd hour that you are usually not awake. Uh, I did that last night as the conference kicked off a little bit before midnight here. Totally worth it. And wherever or uh, whenever you're joining us from, I think you're going to feel the same way about this discussion, especially uh, given our panelists today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, uh, let me say hi and welcome you. Uh, my name is Rob Baker, a humble consultant working on humanitarian technology. Uh, prior to this, uh, in previous roles, I was COO for Shahidi, a White House Innovation Fellow, and later appointee working on data and emerging tech over at USAID's lab, and director for a program on human security, ethics, and remote sensing at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. It is my privilege uh, and a pleasure to be facilitating today's panel. Our session is using machine learning to address data gaps, perspectives in, uh, from climate change, agriculture, and humanitarian relief. Uh, the discussion is born from previous panels hosted by Development Gateway on the topic of machine learning and AI and how these uh, technologies have truly transformed aspects of humanitarian relief and response among several types uh, of humanitarian responses. The presence of this technology, uh, as this has matured, uh, let's review, I think, what we've learned and, and now uh, dig into some of those lessons specifically and critically uh, regarding data gaps. What information is missing? And more importantly, as a result, uh, perhaps who? Despite all these technical advances, what are some communities, uh, why are some communities and considerations still overlooked? Uh, was it the technology that was able to broaden our aperture here and identify uh, these new groups and questions? Or is it this combination of technology and community, how we continue uh, to use tried and trusted methods of leveraging trusted networks and adapting the technology accordingly? All right, so clearly, I have a lot of questions. Uh, fortunately, we have the experts and the thought leaders here to guide us through this. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists for today. As a panelist, I'll, I'll just call it your name and if you could tell us um, name, title, uh, what your organization does and uh, maybe what your, uh, what your day is like uh, briefly. So uh, Charlene, let's start with you. Uh, wait, it's evening here um, in Nairobi. Uh, my name is Charlene Mikwe Kagume. Uh, from Development Gateway, I shall reference ourselves as DG throughout this whole discussion, make sure it's not a mouthful for everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm based in Nairobi, and at DG, we bridge uh, gaps in data use and availability to support stronger decision making. We do this through creating tools and decision processes that help collect, visualize, and use data, and that's why this discussion is particularly important to us, where we focus more on the data use and the uptake of the data, and are some of these projects actually are creating the impact that they're intended uh, to. My day to day, I think it's just engaging stakeholders um, to ensure the use of data. Awesome, welcome. Uh, Ronald. Hello, everybody. It's a uh, good afternoon here in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, my name is Ronald Musime, and uh, I work as the operations and finance manager uh, at uh, uh, OpenStreetMap Uganda uh, Projects Operations, and I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, our work at OSM or OpenStreetMap Uganda is majorly uh, creating a community, uh, empowering a community of mappers, local mappers all around the country to be able to contribute to the open street map uh, and be able to digitize their communities. Uh, the discussion today is very important to us because uh, we, we are in a business of creating a lot of data and especially from our community, uh, local community people, empowering them and giving them the tools and resources to be able to actually participate in the creation of data. Uh, these are not data scientists, um, uh, so that's what we pride so much in because we get uh, the local people to be able to participate uh, in this ecosystem of creating data and being able to utilize it themselves. Uh, that's very, very important for us. And it's, it's very nice uh, for me to be here today to speak about some of our work and be able to present to everyone uh, in this uh, call uh, about some of the work that we do. Uh, my day today is specifically come through to office, um, go a lot in the field. I really, really, really uh, uh, be a lot uh, outside there in the field because our work is empowering community 
uh, local people to understand and know how to utilize, create and utilize the, the data. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Glad to have you. Thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, hello. My name is David Garena, and I'm an agronomist working with QED, which is Quantitative Engineering Design. QED is a tech company that uh, builds data systems and AI for principally applications in agriculture and health for development. Um, we, within the ag field, use a lot of remote sensing to do land use mapping for various public and private sector applications, principally around sort of agriculture, fertilizer use, um, yeah, land use in general. And from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, working with engineers and working with some of our, our data scientists in order to develop some of the, the models, uh, review some of the outputs and, uh, and translate the outputs into really actionable advice for some of our clients. So pleasure being here, looking forward to the discussion. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nakalembe. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. I'm glad to be here. My name is uh, Catherine Nakalembe. I'm an associate research professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Geographical Sciences. Um, and uh, I work under the NASA Harvest Program, which is NASA's agriculture and food security program. And our work primarily focuses on using satellite earth observations, uh, integrating the products and tools into decision making. And we spend a lot of time developing underlying data sets like cropland, crop type, uh, crop conditions, uh, yield modeling. And we do this primarily uh, leveraging satellite earth observations and uh, developing models, uh, machine learning models for, for doing this. Uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, before the pandemic, I used to do a lot of uh, capacity building, uh, working uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, working with ministries um, to develop approaches to leveraging what already exists as well as uh, newer things. My day-to-day -day my day -to -day now is largely sitting here at my desk um, at home and managing um, with my little uh, twin boys. That might show up. I wanted to say that just in case they walk in because they're at home um, due to COVID. Thanks. Glad to be here. I know that I have twins too, and they, they barge in sometimes. And we like the visitors now. It's fun. Uh, thank you for being here. Swetha. Hi, my name is Swetha Ramaswamy. I'm the VP of Data Science at Frame. Um, Frame is a startup that uses uh, machine learning models to produce local information on human and population characteristics in critical geographies around the world, uh, down to a one kilometer level. Our uh, work ranges from climate vulnerability to water use and access. Um, as far as my day-to-day -day at Frame goes, um, one of the things that I think will be a recurrent theme in um, the conversation here today is um, the importance that we understand not only the data modeling side, but also the data engineering and um, infrastructure side and how to make sure that people have access um, to products more than just a one-off time. Um, and so my day-to-day -day at Frame uh, frequently involves the combination of how we can think about methodologies at scale and what are the data engineering principles that we need in order to feed these models to be um, responsive to feedback, easy to understand, and um, can be replicated uh, quickly in the future. Excellent. Look forward to that. And Josh. Hey, thanks, Rob. And hello, everyone. I'm Josh Woodard. I'm the Senior Digital Advisor in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Uh, my day-to-day, -day, I basically uh, provide technical support and, and guidance to uh, colleagues in RFS uh, in the U.S. and then to our missions um, globally on issues related to digital at the intersection of the areas that our Bureau covers. So resilience, uh, food security, agriculture, uh, nutrition, water, uh, security, climate adaptation. Um, yeah, and I'll keep it there because I want to give us, I want us to jump right into the conversation because I'm looking forward to it. All right. And that is, that's a wonderful tip because that's exactly what we're going to do. Our format for now is that we are jumping right into the questions. Uh, I've got a few keyed up here uh, to get things rolling, but we want to make sure that we have ample time for the audience questions at the end. So we are 
diving right in. And, um, you know, let's start with a little bit of what the context looks like, what the practice looks like. And um, Charlene, maybe I can pick on you to go first, but uh, a story here about, you know, how has uh, machine learning and AI been effective, I think, for DG and partners in the field? Awesome, great. So I'll start with saying that, of course, agriculture is a key area of work for DG. And to answer your question, I'll focus on a project that's focused on fertilizer, that's visualizing insights on fertilizer for African agriculture. We call it VIFAR for short. Um, and that's because that's where we've been able to do in-depth uh, machine learning and AI work with our partners, QED in the core, where we work with a number of partners. And why fertilizer was a priority, of course, because we know fertilizer is important to address food security, insecurity, I mean, um, farmers need fertilizer for the right crops um, at the right time, and of course for peak season so that um, they could be able to be as productive as possible. But we saw for this to happen, data will need to be moved from its current siloed state. So you'd find private sector had really good data on pricing, really good data on consumption. You'd find government had good data on imports, fertilizer imports, how much fertilizer is imported on their subsidy programs. But all this data was in its silos. So we worked with a number of partners to be able to aggregate this data and create more informative products, such as the dashboards in different countries on the continent um, to inform decision-making. Of course, at the end goal being to facilitate timely fertilizer access and use. If we talk about machine learning in specific, um, take us back to think about how Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest fertilizer usage in the world. <clears throat> And we've seen crisis after crisis, such as COVID and Ukraine, of course, further uh, affecting fertilizer access, um, accessibility and price. And now that's pushing it to, to pushing the program problem further to have in, because we have insufficient fertilizer to replace soil nutrients that's lost every year to crop production. Uh, but we're having challenges in policy makers, um, private sector, all stakeholders involved to put in the right initiatives to um, address this shortage because we really don't know what's being consumed. And that's where machine learning comes in. When if you think about um, how can we tell whether the, a country has sufficient uh, fertilizer uh, for the necessary crop production in that company, we need to first understand for that country, we need to first understand what's the current fertilizer use, um, what's the volume of fertilizer that's going into the country that they're using. Furthermore, we need to understand What's the total cropland under production? So in a country like Kenya or Nigeria, how many hectares are they actually using to produce data, I mean, to produce fertilizer? And are these two matching? What's being consumed and what the cropland is currently? But we've seen with uh, uh, apparent consumption, so understanding what's being consumed, our partners, AfricaFertilizer.org, are currently collecting that data and validating that data. But the biggest gap has always been cropland. And I think someone had mentioned it in the introduction. How do we know what arable land is currently being um, utilized? And we've seen challenges historically where there's been attempts to map croplands and crop, crop types across the African countries. Uh, for example, Nigeria, where we work with QED. Um, but however, if you think about the immense size of Nigeria, um, it's made traditional mapping pretty expensive. So there are a lot of, it's really cross prohibitive. And that's why we've leveraged on recent uh, advancements in technology. I think my colleague Lindsay can share her screen, where um, we've been able to see, um, been able to come up with such a cropland uh, map, where we are leveraging on technology such as satellite imagery combined with machine learning, and having be able to have uh, rapid and scalable access to high resolution images to develop such maps that can show you the density of cropland across the country. And we're hoping that in starting to engage governments, private sector, we're doing this in Nigeria and Ghana, hope to expand this to other countries, where this can inform decision making by fertilizer manufacturers, lenders, government, to understand and to anticipate the demand for products and be able to meet them for the food security, soil health, and of course, economy um, of any country. So I hope I've answered your question. So just trying to be able to strengthen that data set of cropland to allow countries to be able to uh, prioritize and have initiatives that can push uh, fertilizer use and understand the demand for fertilizer in a country and address that demand. That's fascinating, especially in this current context of Ukraine. I mean, it's, it just underscores, I think, the importance of this. That's uh, amazing stuff there with the arable 
uh, knowing the arable land, the fertilizer uh, levels here and the efficiencies around that, huge. Um, one other uh, technical point too, before I turn it over to another one, uh, we are saving kind of questions for the end here. Feel free to put those in the chat as we go through this here. Uh, we wanna get through some early ones here first, but uh, wanna capture those as we go and we'll have plenty of time uh, for everything at the end. Um, Dr. Nakalembe, uh, maybe I can turn it over to you. Uh, maybe I can also embarrass myself by saying congrats on the medal. I'm sorry, I'm a fan. So I have to uh, geek out a little bit, but um, uh, between NASA Harvest, uh, what's happening at the university, uh, maybe a story from your work as well. Yeah, um, my story kind of uh, ties in uh, with what Charlene was actually talking about. And so I, I'm biased towards agriculture, even though I'm interested in, you know, other um, other work. But I have a, a really good example um, that kind of puts things in perspective. So having um, satellite data is bulk data. It's a lot of data. Um, analyzing and getting insights from it is, is incredibly challenging, actually. Like in the past, to make a map, um, if you've made a map like I did in primary school, you would draw the things, you know, with your hand and like label things. Um, but if you wanted to do it, let's say at a, a, a square kilometer, so you'd have to give a label for each square kilometer. If it's just basically impossible to do it manually to get like this, you know, level of insight that you want to know that in this particular area this is what's there it's a forest it's water or it's uh something green and that something green is crop not grass and if it's crop what crop it is so this is really complex um it's it's basically impossible to do manually um and then add on the fact that we're having more and more satellite data higher resolution data means bigger bulkier data means smaller smaller pixels the smaller areas that you could assign uh individual uh, classes, so you can assign that this tiny, tiny little plot is, is you know, for example, bananas. Um, and now we're in the age of cloud computing, uh, which is, you know, making things even much more interesting. So uh, if I was drawing my map before uh, and then I was doing with a computer, maybe I could label a uh, hundred times as much as I could in a minute with my hand. With uh, cloud, uh, you could level uh, maybe a million times as much as you could on your own local computer. So this opens up a lot of really interesting things in the sense that um, it is now possible to run a whole uh, uh, a global model, a, a global land cover map, if you have the labels, uh, within a couple of days. Before it was impossible, and it could only be done within very few very few groups, right? Um, we're now able to stack all the historical, you've had of uh, the Global Forest Watch data set, uh, all of like 30 years of Landsat data and get, you know, get maps from it at a, at a, um, a reasonable frequency. What that means is that um, we're able to do this because one, we have uh, algorithms, we have some training data, um, and we have the compute to allow us to do this frequently. The frequency is really important because if you want to understand uh, changes in planted area, you might have to do it multiple times. Uh, if, you know, if, if it's a system that's large enough and the methods are developed sufficiently, you might want to do an annual crop type map. Uh, you can do that now. Before this was impossible, and uh, there's there there are many many things in between that you can do that were basically completely impossible. But um, to tie this in in the end, uh, going back to the label, I always talk about this uh, because label data. So these examples that we can use to train. Um, to train, you know, to, to use a model to, to tell us what is in the satellite images across much, much larger area is not that accessible. It's not that easy. So examples of what crop is growing where, this is an example for crop, it, they're very, very limited in uh, that are georeferenced. Um, and so one of the interesting things that we're doing with uh, um, with artificial intelligence within our group is coming up with approaches for uh, generating these labels in a way that can be replicated and is cost effective. How we're trying to do it is, um, this is one of my favorite projects right now, 
uh, is we have, the project is called How Much Labeling Crops. Basically we have like an extension agent driving his motorbike with a GoPro camera, taking pictures as they drive. From those pictures, we use machine learning to extract, we give, you know, we train, we, we give the model examples of this is banana, this is cassava, this is potato. And then we use a model to extract that information. What that is doing is basically when you're driving uh, on the motorbike, you're going really fast. So you cover a much larger area than you would normally do it. If you go with a GPS to record, it just takes forever. It just costs so much to do. Um, but by driving, we're collecting so many images and then we're using machine learning to extract information from all those images and simplify it. So this would be basically impossible. It would be impossible to get crop type examples, uh, let's say for all of Kenya with, you know, the, the landscape is heterogeneous, the farmers do different things, they're growing different crops, the fields are small. And so by doing this very rapid survey, um, extracting that information, we can then train, we can even dream to do like a, an annual crop type map for Kenya. And this is only possible, you know, we can only um, try to dream to do this because we have the tools to, to do it. And also we can store, going back to the cloud example, we can store all the images. So within, uh, within two, three weeks of collecting sample data, we have over a million images. Uh, there's no way a human can go and label those a million images. Uh, it would take forever. You'd have to have a lot of money, a lot of humans. You have to train a lot of humans to do it. And this is where uh, machine learning, satellite data, cloud computing come together and offer these really, really cool solutions. Yeah. That's so it's a really that. exciting time. Yeah. Yeah. That is really cool to see. And, uh, so we have a context here for some of the opportunities around this. Uh, how much more we can collect, how much more we can kind of uh, disseminate and decipher here. Um, let me dig down a little deeper here, though, in terms of how can we introduce, I think, AI and machine learning into these existing projects rather than having the kind of tech have to refactor and reformat these things. David, how about your work at QED and uh, some of the stuff that you're doing here on DHS2 or others? Yeah, well, a lot of our work are very client driven. And usually the clients come in with some set of of specific goals that they're looking to, to solve for. And then we then uh, use the approach of identifying what are the most uh, important tools or more applicable tools to execute and deliver some of those, the insights, data insights. Um, I think it's really important to know that AI is just you know, one, um, a broad set of analytical tools within the, you know, an analytical toolbox. And it's, it's really, they're really not geared towards answering everything for everyone in every way. And even within the broad category of AI, there's many, many, many different types. And so it's really better to understand and really to, to drive much more time to look at what some of the asks are or what some of the objectives are. I think it's much more difficult to come up with a very clear set of of really nice objectives from which then the analyticals can then provide insights towards, um, rather than having the analytics hopefully you know derive some sort of you know magic or um, or, or data mining for you know, solving non-existent problems. You know, I think Catherine's example that she just mentioned is a really good example of okay, we we have this gap that we need in order to generate data, but what are some of the really useful tools? that can be executable at scale to be able to derive that information. And in this case, you know, I would just support what she was saying is that one of the key things about AI coupled with really good compute infrastructure is they can tackle really large problems uh, at a scale that really we couldn't do using other computational approaches or, or manual methodologies. So again, it's, I think it's really about understanding what are some of the use cases and then aligning use cases with you know, applications via you know, modeling frameworks, analytical tools. And that's to say, you know, there's a lot of analytical tools that are, are very you know, useful for doing a lot of things, you know, like Gaussian probability distributions, for instance, if you wanna make you know, site-specific recommendations for management that you can't do using just standard AI tools. So there's really a, a variable amount of, of insights you can, you can glean from you know, specific tools. I also want to support what Catherine and, and uh, what um, what some of the people said about agriculture being super important. You know, just highlighting um, during the, this 
current uh, war with Russia, that from a fertilizer perspective, you know, Russia produces, I think, some of the world's most amounts of potassium-based fertilizers. And basically, those are unavailable on the world market at the moment. Plus, just general fertilizers, the price are really linked towards prices of oil. So there, there's going to be, I think, a, a global fertilizer crisis, which then will lead to you know, potentially crop production crisis over the next couple of years or so. I think it's really important to highlight this and to understand you know, what can we do as a community of uh, data analysts and, and practitioners to kind of help address some of these issues. Yeah, hugely, hugely important. Swetha, have we arrived at that point then? We can talk about infrastructure and modeling that you brought up uh, a little earlier. Yeah. See, there you go. Like I there think Catherine has hit the nail on the head and we've all been reiterating <laughs> it since, right? Because the question here is not just like, what are the creative models that we can build with AI and ML and all the new and interesting algorithms that are being developed here today, but also which one of these things can be replicated quickly and at the scale we need. And speaking to David's point, you know, a lot of these things change very, very quickly depending on the global context we operate in. Um, and I also wanted to double tap on the, um, the point being made here, I think, um, understanding the use case and understanding that tech exists not as an end state but as a process to help solve the types of questions that we're tackling is important to internalize because i think it's easy to want you know infrastructure to solve all of our problems to have cloud computing you know we toss a bunch of data into the model and hope that it comes back out but there isn't any uh replacing humans as part of this process right like to the point being made across the board, um, we have to think not only about how the end users want to leverage our data in order to solve the problems that they are actively working on, but also how can we think through what the answers to these problems should look like based on what experts in the field have seen um, firsthand or the people who are most affected by some of the solutions that we try and generate. Um, so one example that I think of, well, I have like several examples of my time that frame, but um, I, I think one repeated story and question that we get asked a, a lot about is like, we want to introduce this new item in our case, I'm thinking of a clean, working with a clean cook stove alliance to try and you know provide clean cooking stoves to, um, folks in various countries. And it's important to consider not just what selling that might look like and what adoption criteria um, people have, but also to consider what are the unique elements of early adopters versus late adopters and where they live, because where they live will inform a lot of what they will use that for and how likely they are to adopt the new technology. And when clean cook stove approached us you know they are the experts in this field we can provide a landscape of the technology available we have ideas about what predictions we could use we have ideas about who we would like to include as part of our our models like what are the consumer bases that we're modeling here but at the end of the day it's a collaborative relationship between the people who are answering the questions with contextual information that they have from years of working in the field and years of working in the industry and then combining that with our understanding of the technology both from the modeling side but also to make sure that these models that are generated are stored in a way that are reproducible that if we want to revisit it at a later date we can do so that if we want to make changes to that model we can do so very quickly and don't have to wait you know another six months a year down the road in order to generate them and i think that these things are incredibly interrelated it's this idea that technology exists to serve to help solve our problems as opposed to being the end goal that we're trying to build. Well said. Can we can we bookmark that part of it here? There's that last sentence. I just want to frame that. Uh, keeping it. Excellent, excellent stuff. Um, on that note, then, so we've covered here. I think what we're able to kind of pull down and these opportunities from from satellite imagery, machine learning to process all this information. Uh, we're talking about this. Um, Charlene, let me ask though, and I think that, you know, we, we are keeping an eye on the chat. We're going to get to more of these at the end, but I know I'm seeing some here just in terms of concerns of algorithms from training sets from ag spaces versus what we're capturing here. So let's uh, kind of switch it up now. And, and Charlene, 
you know, how do we ensure that the data collected is used effectively and not siloed? And, you know, what are those sources and how are we compiling these things together and some of your work as well? Cool. So I think um, in some of our work, I'll give the example back to our fertilizer work. So we've been able to layer the cropland data that um, I showed in the beginning with other, so other sources of data based on, and I like how everyone is talking about the use case approach. So based on um, some of the blenders and the manufacturers asked, can we be able to understand cropland um, layered over the current blending plant? So I don't know, Lindsay, can you share your screen? So this is one of the use cases that came up based on the request from some of the, the, the users in Nigeria, where we could have fertilizer manufacturers, blenders, governments, to understand their need to better see and anticipate the demand for products and be able to meet that demand, uh, particularly blenders, understand what is the potential in the market and growth over time. So by knowing uh, the crop coverage in different areas, the current blending plants to be able to see um, what areas may need more support and intervention. Um, secondly, I think over and above that, we've seen also blenders uh, contribute to data themselves in terms of consumption once they saw this, because I wanted to now be part of the process and make sure that some of these tools that we developed um, um, are, are, are actually part of the decision making um, as a sector in Nigeria. So the other one I think outside um, fertilizer is actually something that we're doing with DG and we have a project that's focused on tobacco work. So we're working, funded by the Gates Foundation, we're working with African policy makers and other partners um, to use data to promote tobacco control across the continent. One key question that's come up across all countries that we're working in with governments is that how it's unclear to understand <clears throat> uh, how tobacco farming is impacting uh, the farmers themselves. So farmers clear, play, of course, a really big part in tobacco production. Are there alternative crops for equal financial value to farmers? If we know how much cropland and where, uh, tobacco farming is and what crops can do well in those areas and, and of course machine learning as uh, Catherine had mentioned can be able to identify tobacco crops as a crop itself um, and show specific data on that can we can governments work with extension officers to see some of these areas and give alternative crops to be grown um, for those specific soil types so those are the most distinct um, use cases another one that we've seen and been discussed over time of course is climate change models um, and this goes back to the discussion of having consistent cropland data collected so that it can be compared across the years and be able to see the change in cropland and that being triangulated with, um, with data from the ground, ground with data so that we can know what are the, um, what are the socioeconomic or are there other issues such as floods, ETC that are, or drought that are affecting change in cropland over time. So I think we've seen really strong use cases for such data um, it's just being able to triangulate it with um, other data sets. Fantastic. David, same over to you as well with some of the tools and uh, analytical tools you're um, building over there and, and how you're merging kind of local and larger data sets. Oh, so David, is he still there? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I didn't sorry. catch this from my name. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, it's important to note that AI tend to be very data hungry modeling frameworks. And some of the you know, most famous examples of AI would be, let's say, uh, facial image recognition. You know, these models have been built using hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of data sets that are, have been coming through, you know, let's say Google images or Facebook or, or whatnot. And uh, given that context, you know, some of the more difficult problems in the world and more important problems, much more than image recognition for, for faces or for you know, shoes or for you know, whatever some of those advertising are, we think about you know, food security, poverty, hunger. You know, these are very difficult data sets to generate data from. You know, I think Catherine's example of trying to identify you know, what crop is growing where is a great example. You know, in crop type or crop mapping, usually be working with a couple of thousands of, of data points that were you know, generated by you know, multiple years of, of programming, usually through international donors. And, and the data is just not sufficient in enough quantity to be able to train you know, really good models. So because of that, our model predictions can be a little bit limited. 
So opening up, you know, new avenues to collect and share data uh, across different programs is super important. And historically, a lot of the data assets that were supposed to be in the public domain historically haven't been in the public domain for one reason or another. Uh, but fortunately, there's a lot of, of new initiatives coming on board that are, are trying to redo this paradigm and to make data sets both available, um, reproducible, and, and shareable. So, you know, two, I think, prominent examples would be the Lacuna Fund, uh, which has started and launched a couple of years ago. And, you know, they really made the commitment to make all of the outputs from, from the, in the investments from this fund to generate then publicly available data sets used to train AI models. And the other one would be the Radiant Earth Foundation. They've done a lot of really fantastic work about looking at data ontologies, uh, trying to aggregate all different data sets that are, that are out there and available and, and make them that are, that are basically machine readable and deployable you know, from the very beginning. So that there seems to be a, a good um, assessment that this is a, a really a needed avenue at the moment. And there's some good investments being made. I think it's just up to you know, people who are generating the data sets, you know, if they really believe in, in some AI for good, then we need to be able to, to sort of put our data sets in where our mouth is. You know, and for from QED's perspective, you know, all the data that we generate from publicly funded programs are all available on our, our websites free of charge, you know, for use for anybody for any purpose. So, um, yeah, I just would like to say that this is really important to me to contribute to this as a community. Well said and noted there. On that note, um, Ronald, let me ask you too. I mean, how has this technology, I think, changed up um, OpenStreetMap's portion for this? I mean, leading with uh, local mappers doing that, an exciting time for OpenStreetMap, humanitarian OpenStreetMap with the hubs launching. Um, how has this affected uh, your work? And thank you so much. Um, uh, picking it out from uh, David there. Uh, AI has been very important, and um, uh, many people have talked about um, about the use of uh, machine learning in agriculture, especially. And I would like to give uh, one of the land uh, the case uh, users that we've managed to be able to use uh, machine learning at OpenStreetMap, and that's through um, being able to plan uh, the seedling distribution within agriculture. So knowing which crop is growing where is very important. And um, uh, then be able to dispute the um, right seedling uh, for that particular uh, community or uh, environment is, is crucial. And AI is helping and machine learning is helping uh, a lot in that. We are recently implementing a project by uh, Geoglam uh, that was really focusing on uh, ground truthing for uh, machine learning uh, to uh, especially understand clearly is what uh, the machine uh, learning or AI predicting uh, accurate. And I think that's one important uh, factor that we, we all need to embrace. Uh, while we are embracing this technology, we actually need to uh, invest into grand truthing and making sure that uh, the predictions um, machine learning and AI are, are making are actually accurate. And that can be uh, made possible by ensuring that uh, the data, uh, there is some grand truthing uh, that is done. Uh, two, also uh, through empowering uh, local people to be able to contribute this data, uh, that's quite important because um, for the machine learning to happen, there's going to be consistent uh, learning. There's going to be data needed almost every time because our communities, especially in Uganda, in Africa, are changing very rapidly. And um, what you happened last year may not be the same as what is happening now. So investing in empowering local people to contribute data is very critical. And that's what we pride mostly in uh, as uh, OpenStreetMap Uganda, uh, to be able to invest in local people, uh, local communities to be empowered to contribute uh, data that can be used uh, then uh, to create predictions through machine learning. Uh, that's very, very uh, critical to us. And that's how it has been very much helping. We are currently implementing a, a program, uh, a project that uh, aims at estimating the demand of electricity in agriculture that's funded by World Bank. And <clears throat> it has a uh, machine learning component where we'll be able to extrapolate data that can uh, predict for the entire country. But this 
is made possible uh, by ensuring there is ground truthing, going down uh, on ground and getting the local farmer um, to be able to tell you what exactly uh, they need with electricity, how much electricity do they need for them to be able to, for example, cool their milk. Uh, a local farmer in a local village in Western Uganda to be able to cool their milk, they're telling us uh, there is no enough electricity to be able to run my machines. Um, so these are, uh, for, for us, the most important issue is let's get the local people involved. Let's get the local people to contribute this data, participate in contributing the data. Uh, that can really help uh, machine learning a lot. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. So we still have we're seeing again some, how this is being introduced into programs that rely a lot on kind of ground truth and practices on local communities. Uh, but the word I'm taking away from there is investment too. And what about this investment in terms of uh, an investment to ground truth and perhaps commensurate to an investment into new tools and technologies. On that note on investments, uh, Josh over at USAID. So, I mean, let's ask it more plainly now, like how do we know what we don't know? And uh, yeah, I think what's missing from the conversation here and, and how does that really inform investments? Yeah, so I mean, there's obviously a lot of gaps in this space, um, and I can tell you some of the ones that we are particularly focused on, or we being or the team that I work um, with and within my bureau. I mean, one of the things is thinking about how are we involving farmers, uh, both in the design of any technology that that we're using um, or planning to use, thinking about using. Um, and then also in terms of things like governance and ownership. So I think on the design side, you know, we really need to be truly listening to the needs of individuals, understanding what their tech access looks like. Um, you know, do they have access to uh, the relevant devices? Do they have access to say electricity? So on uh, their digital literacy, are they, um, do they have uh, sufficient uh, digital literacy to be able to use uh, both the technology itself, but also in terms of interpreting machine learning results to be able to make uh, you know sufficient use of those. Um, and when it comes to the the governance and ownership side, I think you know we, as we talk more about collecting data from individuals, from in in the case of farmers, if we talk about farmers, you know, we have to think about what is their stake in the governance and ownership of these systems. If we are collecting their data, if we're using data derived from them, uh, you know, we have to be thinking about is the benefit that they're receiving from these technologies proportionate to what they put in um, and to what other, this is the benefit that others are receiving from it. So on that point, uh, we actually just kicked off some research that we're co-funding with the Gates Foundation, which happens to be uh, implemented by uh, Development Gateway, which is going to be looking at some of these questions. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be coming out um, within this year. We'll have um, findings from that coming out. I think you know underlying all of this as well is we need to recognize that individuals are different. They have different needs and there are differences that exist within and between different communities and between certain demographic groups. So we know that you know, women, uh, people with disabilities, they other groups, they tend to have lower levels of access to digital technology. Um, so you know we it's really easy, I think, and oftentimes this happens in uh, certainly in the commercial tech space, but also in the development sector, where we end up designing systems that really address the most easily addressable market segments. Um, and the consequence of that is that they exclude those who are a bit more difficult to serve, uh, who may have lower levels of digital access um, or literacy. And then I think we also have to think about how we're involving local researchers, local technologists um, in the development of research questions and algorithm design uh, to make sure that they really are locally led and contextually appropriate. I mean, there's tons of examples of AI algorithms and systems that were not done this way. And, you know, they get really uh, different results depending on who's using them and, and what sort of questions you're asking. Um, and, and we want to move away from that. And I think this is particularly important 
Um, because at the moment, if you look at the number of AI related patents uh, that are being filed around the world, the vast majority of them are concentrated in just a handful of countries. Um, and so that means that most likely those countries are likely to see some of the greatest economic benefit from the global application of these technologies. So we really need to be thinking about, you know, what can we be doing to stimulate more locally generated intellectual property in this field as well? Because I think that that will have potential economic uh, consequences as well um, moving forward. And then the, the last thing that I'll note here is, you know, I think we also need to consider the longer term implications and some of the unintended consequences that may come from uneven uptake of ML or AI um, technologies, uh, you know, and this is both in the context of agriculture as well as other sectors. Um, so if we look at the likelihood that a smallholder farmer in Niger, for example, is going to have access to AI and ML enabled services uh, on the same time frame as a large scale commercial farmer, uh, perhaps even in that country or in neighboring countries, I mean, very likely they're not going to have access <laughs> on the same time frame. So, what are those implications in terms of their ability then to compete in the marketplace if there is a significant gap in access to some of these really uh, high potential um, technology applications? And so, another plug on that <laughs> is uh, again with the Gates Foundation, uh, we're also undertaking a study uh, that will be looking at the implications of AI and automation on employment and inclusive economic uh, development, specifically uh, as it relates to um, agri-food systems. So that's something that is about to kick off and that will also be coming um, later this year. So I guess with all of that to your question, you know, how do we know what we don't know? A lot of it is research, you know, asking these questions, really thinking about these things, uh, but it doesn't always have to be super deep, robust research. You know, it also is just from, from observation, from experience, from asking questions, from, you know, really challenging assumptions and thinking about things through the perspective of different uh, segments within a community, you know, not only thinking about uh, the perspective of a um, a majority um, segment within a community, but really thinking about it from how it impacts a whole wide range of people within uh, the community. And I will stop there. <laughs> that is great. So much to dig in. Uh, Lindsay, thank you for putting that in the chat, maybe sharing some of those data sources that you mentioned and some of these things you plugged here. It sounds like excellent resources. Our time is getting tighter than we thought, so I'm going to change it up a little bit. I know I have a question off of that in terms of value add, but I love this question in the chat regarding good data on women and girl farmers is hard to get. Does anyone have examples of how they're using ML to tackle this crucial issue? I will open that up to the panel if anyone does have examples uh, for this important question. I can start briefly and then I'm very curious about um, other panels panelists answers to this question because I think um, specifically when we're talking about agriculture and smallholder farms and trying to make sure that our our work is actionable and usable by by folks who might have where there's unequal access I'm like particularly curious about people more tapped into that but I will say from the frame perspective because our work focuses on population and country populations as a whole um, when we work with data we do a lot of cross-referencing of that data with other data sets that exist so what I mean by this is you know when we have a demographic and household survey we might compare it to the LSMS we'll compare it to a few different estimates about um, what we expect the population of women and girls to be like in a data set and unsurprisingly um, the data sets are always imbalanced but kind of the magic of the world that we live in is that we're able to see that pretty easily clearly and there are statistical ways of helping to address that um, it's not great it's not a great solution I think the answer is um, definitely focusing on the data input side and making sure that the information collected is representative of the um, groups that we're talking about and our experience with that has been to reach out specifically to folks who who meet the profiles particularly of 
uh, typically underrepresented groups. Um, but again, that is just from our perspective. And I have to say, like, I'm much more curious about what the other panelists have to say on this topic. With only a few minutes left, would anyone else like to dive in on this one? Friends, our silence means we need a lot more work to do on this. I think that's my takeaway here, okay? We know it, we know it. Um, very quickly then, um, let me just, as we finish up lightning round here, what's next for machine learning in all of these uh, respective contexts? Um, quick answers only, Josh, let me start with you. Yeah, so I think um, for us, it's all about responsible ML, responsible AI. Uh, for those who listen to uh, USA Administrator's uh, opening remarks yesterday, she mentioned the AI action plan that USA is putting out soon. So stay tuned for that. That'll sort of lay out a lot of our, our thoughts on uh, where we're going in this space. Awesome. I'm going to go down the list as I see you on my screen. Charlene. Um, I think it's I think everyone has mentioned focusing on the use cases. So being more disaggregated in specificity in our data, in our data sets. So the tobacco example I gave, um, and in future thinking beyond just the technology and focusing on the use case and being more, being as disaggregated as possible as we can be. And of course, integrating ground truthing into that process. And in that way, I like the idea of the gender where we could think about more gender specific uh, data sets. And that's something at DG we've been really trying um, to brainstorm around. Awesome. David. David, go on quickly. Is that me? There you go. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, un understanding and overcoming ground truthing data scarcity. Well done. Said quickly, Swift. Um, I, I think. I, I have to double tap on Josh's point. Um, I think that there is a huge conversation to be had here around ethics and AI. And uh, interestingly, in the ag space, I'd say a lot of discussions to be had about combining personal identifying information with satellite imagery in a way that we have unprecedented access to. Awesome. Dr. Nakalembe? Um, mine is definitely going to go on, uh, on the ground truthing, having an open accessible data set or benchmarking uh, in a way that we can evaluate products that are coming out uh, where we don't go with the floor. We don't believe someone's product just because they said it's fantastic. So a way of evaluating these things that could have like consequences down the line for use cases, for example, like insurance that could make farmers lives more miserable rather than uh, rather than better. So like working in that, working in that space is something that I think is absolutely critical. Awesome. And Ronald in our remaining seconds. Yes, again, uh, ground truthing has come up very, uh, very profound there. Uh, mine is invest in the equipment uh, for, for all the, uh, the machine learning, but let's be more intentional in uh, getting more local data users uh, involved in creating the data, uh, but also in empowering them to use the data. Fantastic. Friends, thank you so much. I want to thank all the panelists uh, for joining us. I want to thank everyone who joined us uh, for this important session uh, and to Development Gateway, I think, for sponsoring this. Uh, I know I'm taking away huge lessons here that we will no doubt uh, bring into a new session here regarding this commensurate investment uh, into ground truthing here, uh, local versus large data sets, uh, how we're building efficiency at those local levels as well, thinking about the tech adoption. Um, and I think I've, I've, I've underlined ground truthing, so I'll just bring it up a second time here. Uh, I hope you all have taken something for yourselves away from this session. Thank you all so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you again, everybody. <laughs>